I think uh, I was chosen to come to work here because um, I'd been working with the Institute of Chartered Financial Analysts in developing a, uh, a paper that was associated with the impact of robotics that would be on Fed policy. And as I started to do a lot more research, it became very, very evident that robotics is going to be really a creator of a new uh, revolution in terms of our economy and, and the way we actually think, work, and act. Um, uh, but uh, as an economist, I'm excited about all these different facets, and we'll get into a number of those. But we all know that the study of the economy is called the dismal science, and it's done so for a very good reason. And I'll give you a quick example. Uh, many of you recall when we used to have a Soviet Union, the, the USSR. And every May Day, they used to have a, a parade that distributed or displayed their military might. And there was this one particular May Day. I recall Leonid Brezhnev was the uh, chairman at that point in time. And uh, he was sitting in the reviewing stand, and this went on for hours, and thousands of troops marched through Red Square. Then the tanks rumble through, and then the half-tracks, and then finally the, uh, the missile launchers came through the, uh, the Red Square. And the, uh, the dignitaries were all sitting and watching this display of military prowess. At the end of this display, however, there were three men, pinstripe suits, horn-rimmed glasses, carrying briefcases, arguing with one another behind the, uh, the last of the missile launchers. Chairman Brezhnev turned to the general beside him and said, Comrade General, who are those three men? And the response was, why, well, Comrade Chairman, those three men are economists. And at that point in time, Brezhnev blew up. He said, what are these men doing in my display of military power? And uh, the response was, why, well, Comrade, of all the things you have seen there today, those men are the most dangerous. Turned out to be true, didn't it? You probably caught my accent. I lived in Texas for a long time. We had a uh, president from that state who had an economic policy called guns and butter. You may recall that. Guns were to halt the spread of communism in Southeast Asia, and butter was the creation of the great society. And when you think about it, what we were never able to accomplish with guns and halting communism, we did with butter. Our economic system was just that much superior when Ronald Reagan kicked off his Star Wars initiative uh, Gorbachev had really no recourse but to capitulate, and he tore down the wall, as President Reagan suggested. But that's enough on the economy. I'd like to really talk about fruit today. Um, we all know what this is. Come on, work with me. <laughs> apple, all right. A lot of historical perspectives in the apple. We all know the Bible, Genesis. God created man and woman. They lived in the uh, Garden of Eden. They frolicked there in their innocence. God came down and spoke to them and said, you may partake of all the fruit of this wonderful garden except the apple. And no sooner than God ascended back into heaven that somebody from the DNC convinced Eve to bite the apple. We all know what happened then. Innocence was lost. Uh, they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden. They had to hide their nakedness with figs, fig leaves. And when you think about fig leaves, you think about figs, naturally. And when you think about figs, you naturally think about fig newtons. And then when you think about fig newtons, you certainly recall the founder of fig newtons, Sir Isaac Newton. Right, Adam? <laughs> and uh, uh, we all know what happened with Sir Isaac Newton. He was sitting under the apple tree, and it... Oh, there it goes. It fell. That gave Newton his first law of motion, which was the postulate of gravity. But something happened when I dropped that, and it'll happen again when I drop this metaphysical experiment. It went down, but it also came back up. And that led Newton to his third law of motion, which is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And I'm here to tell you that the laws of physics and the laws of economics are very, very similar. And we try to fight that, but they're always in that case. Uh, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction in our economy. Um, let me give you an example if I can make this thing work. You'll have to help me if this isn't the case. Um, something happened in 1969 that was germane to this particular discussion, but it served as a tipping point. And that was uh, the Cuyahoga River 
and Cleveland caught on fire. And uh, we as a society, we decided that we didn't want to have waters that can catch on fire. We wanted to have clean air, and consequently, two years later, uh, Congress passed the Clean Air, Clean Water Act. And we're real good about solving problems. Humankind is very good about that. Not so good, however, about looking at the unintended consequences or those, those rebounds that occur that are unexpected. And so what happened after we uh, saw this clean air and clean water is that unemployment started to rise in the manufacturing sector. Uh, prior to 1969, about a quarter to a third of our population that was employed was employed in the manufacturing arena. After the passage of these very stringent laws, uh, we basically exported manufacturing overseas. And anybody that's witnessed the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Olympics in China, in Beijing, uh, and we saw the pollution that occurred there, they made a societal decision as well. Their societal decision was that they wanted to build a middle class, and they did so by really, really exploiting their manufacturing capabilities at the sacrifice of their environment. But the unintended consequences is that we manufacturing in this new country was shipped offshore. Um, now, the reason why I think this is important uh, is that we are certainly in another tipping point. Uh, yeah, I will. Uh, we, we'll be going to another tipping point, and um, that is that um, I think 2014, we really did see uh, the advent of changes in perception on robotics in this country. Um, the, uh, previously, we had looked at robotics, I think, as most people had, as big manufacturing arms that welded things together, that took place in, uh, pretty much in Detroit, not many places otherwise, but did really do a good job in terms of welding. And you can see from the slide here a lot of the pictorial evidence in that regard. Uh, otherwise, we looked at um, robotics from a Hollywood eye. You may recall, I want your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle, that Arnold said when he was the Terminator. Uh, neither of those two really are very pervasive any longer. But in 2014, we started to see a real change, a real change in perceptions. We, uh, we saw Amazon start to talk a little bit about the, um, the fact that they wanted to deliver goods and services uh, via drones. We saw drones in warfare being very successful, where we could have people that are in Utah manning aircraft, or at least de designing aircraft and flying them in places in the Middle East, and degree of safety in that regard. We saw the advent of self-driving cars, and this really captured the imagination. We heard Google do this, and then that has been very, very quickly followed up by a consortium of BMW, Ford, uh, and uh, even Apple, again, raised its head in that regard. Um, we even, in my industry, are looking at what are known as robo-advisors. Uh, Vanguard and a number of other big financial institutions are really pushing and focusing on that. But when you think about it, this robotics is happening at a really, really good time in this country's particular future. Uh, we are looking at um, a labor force that is slowing. And we're looking at also a uh, level of productivity that is weaker than we have expected. And if you look at this particular chart, you can see the 10-year moving average is actually starting to go below the trend line that's expected. Well, there's an old economic rule of thumb that you can take the labor force growth rate together with its productivity, and that's the intrinsic growth rate of your economy. Now, sure, there's going to be other uh, issues that will uh, change those, but intrinsic growth is really what we're looking at and sustainable, and, and those are a function of labor growth and productivity. And that's, that, that's one of those immutable things up until now. 
But now we're looking at a whole different paradigm, I think. It's, it's a different situation when we are experiencing a change over from human labor to mechanical labor. Now, we've had really four major economic revolutions uh, in this country. Uh, we had the agricultural revolution, you may recall. Uh, we had an agrarian society from the outset of our country. Uh, and even before that, we had uh, uh, another economist, Malthus, who said that we were going to starve to death because there hadn't been really any changes much in terms of productivity in the agricultural sector. That certainly did change. Technology will always trump the economic projection. Uh, the second one was the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this occurred in the, uh, the 19th century or so, and, and we had another famous economist, uh, William Stanley Gervon, a uh, British economist who said we were going to run out of coal, uh, and therefore the steam engines would not be able to perpetuate uh, the expansions that we saw during the Industrial uh, Revolution era. And then third, we have most recently had the dot-com, the computer and the info technology area that has certainly been a revolution. But when you think about each one of those three revolutions, they have generated huge economic booms. They have had great investment alternatives and options that were available as a result of those. And they have all three generated major positives for mankind. Is there any reason to think that the fourth revolution, that of robotics, will be any different? I, I don't know, and I'm not sure we're going to have an answer today, but we're going to try to explore that. Um, a smart economist uh, always looks back in history. And in fact, you may recall Patrick Henry's famous uh, give me liberty or give me, give me death speech. But in there, he also, also said, I have but one light by which my feet are guided and that is the lamp of experience. I know no way of judging the future but by the past. And that's what we'd like to do. If you look at this latest, or the industrial revolution that we had, you know, it was prefaced by the steam engine and the use of steam power and other mechanical devices to replace human labor, or at least to supplant it. Um, but when you think about it, look at what other things that were associated with that on the periphery. To have an industrial revolution, you had to have people migrate to the cities, to the plants. And those cities had to be developed. And how do you develop a city, OK? If you can't expand linearly and you have to expand up and down, it's very, very difficult. And it's a new paradigm, new way of thinking. And that led to a whole lot of industries, you know, changes in transportation, uh, changes in building techniques, where you had a city block that could only handle maybe 20 people if it's flat, could handle 1,000 people if it's built upward. And the only way that could happen is if you had elevators and you had air conditioning. So the Industrial Revolution itself spawned a whole different way of developing our economy and our nation. It is something that I think is going to happen with regard to robotics as well. We've seen a lot of material on robots. There's hardly a week that goes by. There's not a major piece that comes out on robotics pro or con. Uh, and we, we have to try to develop not only what they're going to do, but what is this infrastructure, the opportunities that infrastructure is going to have for us to be able to develop our mankind and, and develop our employment. Um, now, the robotics revolution is, um, did I go the wrong way? Sorry. Uh, I think there are three things that are going to come to mind. Uh, one of my good friends, Eric Aleas, uh, he's an engineer with Siemens and is a part of the UCF uh, executive uh, board uh, of their uh, engineering department, says that the three things that are going to be most prevalent are jobs that are going to be replaced that are dangerous dirty or demeaning. And when you think about the things that, that we have in terms of occupation that are in those three areas alone, it's very, very significant. We've got soldiers that are out there placing their lives at risk. We have policemen, we have firefighters, we have logging, fishing, electrical workers, all of which are in very hazardous uh, occupations. 
We have dirty jobs, mechanics, agricultural workers, roofers, painters, and particularly here in DC, we have the politicians. <laughs> Just had to throw that in, I'm sorry. Uh, we also have demeaning uh, positions. Uh, think about waste disposal. Uh, we have slaughterhouses that have to be manned. We have transportation, people that are driving um, across the country in a truck that's delivering goods uh, across country that is working 12 hours a day. Uh, those are the three areas that I think that will have the most significant and the quickest impact. Now, disagreeing with uh, Mr. Haleas uh, is the World Economic Forum. Uh, and you may recall they, they met this past winter in Davos, as they, they inevitably do, and they talked about this fourth industrial revolution and the fears that are coming out of that uh, and the concerns that they have. I think they cited that there will be 7 million jobs lost in the uh, next uh, six years, no, excuse me, the next four years, and only 2 million that will be recovered as a result of that. Uh, and they feel that two-thirds of those lost jobs will be in the office and managerial areas. Certainly, we see a lot of things that will occur. As I was doing this research for the CFA Digest, um, they, uh, it is amazing what now robots can do in terms of surgery, in terms of legal, in terms of composing, in terms of writing. Uh, the Da Vinci surgical uh, equipment is uh, uh, really uh, propelled uh, its uh, parent company uh, to a very, very strong investment performer. So a lot of those things are going to take place. Now, some of the other benefits uh, of this robotics revolution are, are certainly highway deaths. Uh, essentially, there are 92 people that die every single day on our highways. This can perhaps be eliminated as a result of self-driving cars. They can be much more accurate. They won't blink, they won't fall asleep. They'll stay within the speed limits. Uh, those are, are critical issues. Healthcare, uh, we, uh, we know that um, the Prime Minister of Japan, Abe, uh, indicated that he felt that robots would triple in, in Japan by 2020 and the use of robots in healthcare because of their aging population and need for healthcare and health maintenance is going to stimulate that, that growth that will be very exponential in Japan. We've seen that 8.5 billion was spent by corporations last year alone on artificial intelligence. Well, that didn't necessarily produce anything, but it did employ people. And we think that those kinds of things will continue as we see this uh, emergence in the robotics arena. The European Commission spends tens of billions of euros every year on technology to, uh, to help the elderly. Agricultural benefits uh, are, are pretty amazing. Uh, there was an article I saw that was in Tech Insider and that the headlines were the world's first robot run farm will harvest 30,000 heads of lettuce a day. Uh, profit margins in corporations. Uh, we think that this is gonna be a very, very significant factor and a big force. Uh, Tech Insider again cited that these warehouse robots can boost productivity by 800%. Now, uh, Marion and I were talking earlier about slow growth in this country. And I mentioned the fact that it, it's a function of productivity and labor force growth rate. We have a whole different ball game when it comes to robots being that level of employment. And so we can maybe look at a more intrinsically higher level of growth and certainly profit margins to corporations will expand uh, again exponentially. There are environmental aspects that are also very positive. Robots don't need water. They don't produce waste necessarily. They don't absorb nearly as much materials as individuals and people do as they are clothed and housed. Um, so from an environmental perspective, uh, robots can be very positive. Um, the changes that'll take place because of, uh, again, uh, highways uh, being more safe, uh, I think changes in insurance will take place there and torts will certainly decrease as a result of that. We'll see more opportunities for leisure, recreation, and entertainment. 
Uh, and as Marion indicated, the exploration of the oceans, which represent two thirds of our uh, entire planet, uh, can be um, exploited much more dramatically. Uh, it's a hostile environment. Antarctica is a hostile environment for human beings, but not necessarily so for robotics. And that's going to be critical. Now, this past year, in, in December actually, there were four new elements added to the periodic tables. Four new elements. And those are all found on land. Uh, think about what will take place if we've got two-thirds of our world that we can more adequately understand. And robotics can help, certainly help that. And that whole, it can really be a boon for mankind all the way around. Uh, we will also experience lower prices uh, for goods and services, I think. Much like Walmart did with cheap labor, and they could bring down prices so dramatically, obviously most every corporation that produces something or has a service can also bring down prices. So let's look at some of the negative consequences. Certainly, uh, Adam will uh, uh, enumerate a number of others that I'm sure will be on his place, but um, labor unions obviously will, I think, collapse as a result of this. Minimum wage that we're so, push, so pushing so hard now will just accelerate the trend towards robotics. Uh, gender equality issues, like uh, the one that was recently uh, passed in California, uh, that also will push more use of robotics across our country. Uh, those are negative consequences, I think, and they're going to be present there, things we have to be aware of and prepare for. Social Security. Obviously, uh, we know that Social Security is teetering on the brink now because we now have more people that are drawing than they are contributing. Uh, if we have significant levels of unemployment as a result of that, uh, that will further exacerbate the problem with regard to Social Security. Medicare will even be worse. Big, big problems with both those major finances of our government. Our obligations will uh, become hard to uh, accommodate. Uh, and then finally, tax policies are going to have to change. Uh, I'm a pretty conservative individual, uh, and I would normally say that we need to cut back taxes uh, on corporations in particular because of the tax levels. But I think we're going to see a period because of increased profit margins uh, by corporations where we will have to tax them more. You can't tax a robot. He doesn't make income. You can't tax his house. Uh, and get property taxes. He doesn't do that. He's not going to pay taxes at Starbucks when he buys his cup of coffee because he doesn't need a cup of coffee. We will have to find new ways of generating revenue for our government in order to accommodate this major, major shift in our economy. As an economist, um, obviously, I like to look at the challenges that are out there. And certainly, the greatest of challenges that I see uh, that we're going to have to accommodate is uh, you always hear economists talk about equilibrium, supply, demand, this, that, and the other, where X crosses Y and this, that, and the other, IS and LM curves intersect. Uh, but there is going to be a definite thought that has to be put into the fact that it, there will be an equilibrium point where consumption of robots or the products that they produce are going to be inconsistent with the level of unemployment that is out there. People are not going to be able to buy those products if they don't have income. Uh, people are not going to be able to buy a robot to make their leisure time more palatable if they can't afford that robot. So those are factors that uh, will have to happen, and smarter economists than I will come up with some way of being able to determine this equilibrium point at which there's an intersect. Uh, there could be a situation where advances in robotics are so rapid that the employment shifts that typically occur as we have these uh, revolutions uh, are not quick enough to avoid social conflict. Uh, we can't train people to change fast enough. We are having major, major efforts taking place in the sciences, engineering, technology, and math areas, and they're pushing that very hard. Uh, but uh, it will, it's not happening fast enough, and we will have problems with uh, reallocating the resources that are human. Uh, and then third, um, we'll have a lot of government changes. Tax policy's got to change. 
uh, AI develops such that drones might become autonomous. And that's a big fear that's out there, particularly when it comes to warfare. Uh, we just saw the president of Syria gas his people, despite the fact that we have treaties that really focus on no biological or chemical warfare. Uh, but those treaties can put, be put asunder. Uh, so government is going to have to really step into the case. Um, and, and that's a fear. Uh, I'm a lot older than most of you. But I remembered very distinctly when we were crossing the Delaware, George turned to me and said, government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is a force. Like fire, it is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. Never for a moment should it be left to irresponsible action. We have to make sure that our governments recognize these challenges and prepare for them. 